Hello and welcome to Connect with Chris, where we catch up with our distinguished alumni from the School of Communications at Quinnipiac University. With us today is Chris Mead. Chris is a 2014 graduate in the film program who was recently named to Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So 30 Under 30, tell us about how that happened uh, and the company that you started. Yeah, so back in 2017, uh, my friends and I were all getting back together in Connecticut, and we had an idea for a four-way volleyball net. So we literally pulled out our 401ks, pulled all the money in our bank account, and literally just invested in this prototype we had made. It was a two badminton nets that intersected, and it was four-way volleyball. We made up some rules in our backyard. We brought it to the beach. It was just an absolute blast, and we're like, hey, if we are, we're not on our phones, we're not, we're having fun. Why wouldn't every kid in America go play this? So found a distributor online. I'm sure we'll get into that, but essentially got some prototypes mailed over to us in the U S ended up purchasing about a hundred of them. And we've scaled the business to over eight figures in three years. Wow. So yeah, quickly, uh, it's now sold in over 2000 retail stores and 10,000 schools, uh, and becoming the fastest growing outdoor game in the entire country. So I've played, volleyball with one net yep. two teams but i've never played it for with four way how, how does that work yeah so it's uh every man for themselves so one person in each square and so the person that's called the king so it goes back to like four square which is a recess game serves the ball diagonally across to the second square and from there you return the ball anywhere so it's a free-for-all and if the ball lands in your square you're eliminated and whoever serves aka the king gets one point so if you stay alive you get a point Game to 11, win by two. And you said this is uh, this is growing in schools. Yeah, so right now we're in over 10,000 schools. So what's really cool is I never played volleyball a day in my life. Uh, I didn't like it growing up because like most people, you play in gym class, you touch it three times in an hour, and you're like, hey, I wish I was playing basketball instead. Uh, but now kids are actually introduced to cross net, which is when they're eight years old or 10 years old, they're spiking the ball in their friend's face, which is fun. And they're consequently learning the skills of volleyball by accident. So now they, it comes time where they're available to play uh, in gym class, not the gym class, available to play for like the school team. And they're like, oh, I actually know, I know how to play. So it's becoming like a segue sport for volleyball, which is amazing. And also uh, intramural programs across the country. Are there any schools yet that have four-way teams? So we just released our doubles net which makes the game. So normally it's a solo sport, every man for themselves. We just put out our doubles net right before COVID. So we're kind of introducing it now that we're starting to get back to being able to do this. Uh, so there will be teams. We just actually shot a commercial uh, last Friday with eight professional volleyball players, like four of them are the top 10 in the world. So teams are coming, events are coming, uh, televised, all of that will be happening later this year. Wow. So you mentioned that you guys are in uh, 2000 stores like Dick's Sporting Goods. How did you, uh, how did you uh, make that happen? Yeah, so we have a very large social following. Um, obviously spend tons of money on digital advertisement. So get a lot of traction to our site. We get tons of sales organically from our e-commerce store, but getting actually into the Dick's was when I graduated from, not when I graduated, when I started the company, the first thing I did was build up my LinkedIn presence. And I did build up the LinkedIn after I graduated Quinnipiac, helped me get my first few jobs. But I would reach out, I'd add every single buyer and every single marketer at the company that I eventually want my product to be in. So I post daily. I have a rather large following on LinkedIn now. And then the buyer would like my post or the marketing team would like my post and it would be in their newsfeed. And then when I go out to actually message them, it's much less of a colder touch. I mean, I, can, I get so many sales pitches a day. I can only imagine the buyers at these stores. So when it was time for me to reach out, I was much more receptive. But Dick specifically actually came through to our website on a chat bot. He never wrote back to my message, but he wrote on the, our chat bot and said, hey, this is the buyer from Dick's. I have an order for you. Just write back. And we wrote back and it was for 5,000 units. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. And how much does a how much does a unit sell in a store for? So it's one hundred and fifty. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, pretty good margins. Uh, really good for the business. So yeah, five thousand unit order definitely. Uh, it's rather nice. Yeah. And uh, how did you find uh, a manufacturer? So we used to sell like 
knockoff hockey jerseys on the internet. And the best way to find it was like through AliExpress and Alibaba. So we knew that we could just type in volleyball net. And so when we typed in volleyball net, there is like a million different suppliers. So in the early days, we would just message like 10 or 15 and say, hey, we have a great idea. Are you open to talking? Uh, we eventually found a few that we had like a really good rapport with, sent them over the prototype. It was just a, an AutoCAD like drawing. And eventually we pitched a few suppliers. Most of them said, hey, minimum order $100,000 or something. And we were just what, 24 back then. So nobody had $100,000 or even close. And we found one supplier who was willing to take a chance on us. She made a hundred, uh, probably cost us around like now 10 grand all in for packaging and everything like that. And uh, that's still a supplier that we work with to this day. She took a chance on us. We said, hey, we promise it's going to be worth it one day. And now she's fulfilling 50,000 units at a time. Do they, uh, do they ship directly to the retailer or directly to the customer or? No, so they work? ship, we have, uh, we just moved our warehouse. So we had a huge warehouse out in, uh, in Connecticut where we're from. And we just moved it out to Escondido, California, where I live now, I live in San Diego. So we have a huge fulfillment center in Escondido. And then we also have one in Canada and one in Australia as well. But yeah, we ship directly from our Chinese uh, manufacturing places to our, uh, to our warehouse. And then we ship to the end consumer. Okay. All right, Chris, we're going to take a break and we're going to return with more Connect with Chris with Chris Mead. All right, we are back on Connect with Chris with Chris Mead, an alumni from the school, an alumnus from the school, who was recently named to Fortune Magazine's 30 Under 30. Chris, how did you get to Quinnipiac? Um, I grew up in Connecticut in Woodstock, so it's about an hour and a half away. I wanted to stay close enough for my family, but far enough for my family, if that makes sense. So I uh, visited the campus one day and just Beautiful, right? Beautiful women, beautiful school. It, it was perfect. Uh, made a lot of sense. So uh, I was into film. Uh, growing up, I grew in a very, very small farm town. And my whole dream was to always become a horror movie director. I love scary movies. Uh, I saw that, it, like, I guess the entrepreneur in me knew that there's only a few good horror movie directors and everything else was kind of just crap. And it still is to this day. Uh, there's like one guy like the, So anyways, uh, that was my whole goal is to be a director of horror movies. I went to Quinnipiac to try to pursue that. And so, yeah, that was, it was fun. Good time. So I saw on your LinkedIn page that uh, you were, you did a lot of photo work when you were in college. You had yeah. your own like photo business. How did you get into that? So I needed, a, I was always renting a, a camera from school FBI and always getting the late fees, right? So never returning it on time. I figured it's time to uh, purchase my own. So I got a nice uh, Canon Mark V, which I still have. And I would just find people on Craigslist, Facebook. It was kind of the my first self business. So I'd go shoot weddings on the weekend, do small commercials. I'm far, like looking back, the, the work wasn't the best, but it was a good good lesson in like getting myself out there, selling selling my services, knowing your own value and your time. So it was, it was a good little stab. And I, I still have my camera. I still shoot when I can. Uh, this time we need better photographers than, photographers than me these days. Yeah. What else were you involved with on campus? Um, so I was a, in the Delta Tau Delta fraternity. So that was good. I uh, had a good group of friends there. I uh, would go to the FBI. What is it? The, the meetings on Monday nights. I remember at like nine o'clock. That was fun. I forgot the name of it. The FBI club. Uh, and oh, intramural basketball. I love intramural basketball and football. Okay. Yep. Okay. And when you got out of college, uh, did you try and pursue film or? Uh, yeah. What did... So I graduated uh, in 2014. I was working as a set production assistant uh, for HBO, uh, the show called Girls in New York City. I was there. Man, it, it's one thing for somebody to tell you about the grind of like being on set in the film world. It's another actually living it. Um, so I was waking up every morning at 
four thirty, five a.m., taking a subway throughout the city, like getting to set on China in Chinatown in Manhattan, and not getting home till nine o'clock. I was doing the same wow. thing over and over and over again, five days a week, six days a week, and it's pretty sad. But yeah, I kind of felt burnt out after the first year. I was like, I don't know how much I could do this anymore. Plus, I had student loan debt. Uh, the rate that you make on set is nothing compared to the debt that I had at the moment. So the two just did not balance out at all. Uh, so I guess, I guess you could say I kind of gave up on that dream a little bit earlier. It felt like I worked my whole life to get somewhere and I kind of gave up a little bit earlier, but just, I, I couldn't make ends meet and live in Manhattan. I would have to take a train in like three hours from Stanford. Uh, so I ended up pivoting and I got a, a media buying job at a company in, in uh, Stanford. So I was buying commercials, radio, uh, negotiating and all of that. So I thought it was kind of a, a good segue. What do you feel like the the film program or the film degree, the classes you took, how did that help you though with CrossNet now? Do you feel? Oh, oh it's so, so important. Just like having that eye for film and what actually works and what doesn't work, what's aesthetically pleasing. Right now I'm working on a, a billboard. So we're doing billboards all across the country. So like we're working on like the designers are sending me stuff and it doesn't fit the rule of thirds. So like doing all that stuff is, is super, super important still. Um, especially in the early days when we had no money to our name. I was the one running around with the camera, coming home, editing the clips, running Facebook ads on it. We absolutely didn't have a dollar to our name to pay anybody else. So if I didn't have those skills, uh, cross that definitely wouldn't have even been off the ground. All right, Chris, here's the segment of the show where we're going to ask you some questions to get to know you a little bit better. Let's do it. So the first question is hot dogs or hamburgers? Hamburgers every day of the week. And, and what do you take on your hamburger? Uh, we got bacon, jalapeno peppers, red peppers, barbecue sauce, grilled onions, grilled mushroom. Wow, that's, yep. that's intense. That's, the that's like a Five Guys burger. That, that's literally the Five Guys burger right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I think I know the answer to this question, mountains or beach? So you think you would know that answer. But I well, love I'm, the, see, I'm I seeing some I love, surfboards behind I, you. <laughs> I love the mountains. There's nothing more. If I had my way, my girlfriend didn't have hers. We'd be living in Wyoming uh, next to the mountains and snowboarding every day of the year. Uh, but the company obviously does rely on the beach and getting outside. So uh, I'll say beach for now. Uh, retirement sport. Let's go to the mountains. All right. Coffee or tea? Tea. Absolutely. Tea. Actually, the, the real answer is matcha. Green tea. All right, I was gonna ask you what kind of tea, but you, yep. you answered it. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate, absolutely addicted. I'm on day 11 with no chocolate right now. Oh, right wow. Yep. Are, are we talking like chocolate candy, chocolate ice cream? We're talking chocolate muffins, we're talking chocolate milkshakes, chocolate milk, you name it, I'm drinking it, so I gotta stop. All right, mornings or night? Night. Uh, I like staying up. It's nice to just be focused and be on, like, just be able to work on myself and, and not worry about the company during the day. So night's nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, given your, your interest in horror films, I think I may know the answer to this one. Drama or comedy? Uh, drama. Absolutely right. drama. All right. What's your all-time favorite horror movie? Oh, The Wrong Turn is a great one. Or uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Wow, Texas yep. Chainsaw Massacre, that's a classic. classic. It is a classic. <laughs> steak or seafood? Steak. Steak, steak, steak. And and uh, how do you take your steak? Medium rare, always more on the rare side. Okay. Yep. All right, here's a Connecticut question for you. Sally's or Peppies? Peppies. Don't even start. Peppies. <laughs> and what's your favorite pie at Peppies? Uh, pepperoni bacon with a uh, Fox and Park root beer. Again with the bacon, I'm noticing a trend here. Yep. Both the hamburger and the pizza gets bacon. Absolutely. <laughs> dogs or cats? Dogs, allergic to cats. You're allergic to cats, do you have a dog? I do, I have a French bulldog. Very cool, what's his yep. name? Sosa. Sosa, is that yep. after Sammy Sosa? Yeah. <laughs> was Sammy Sosa your favorite? No, nah, not my favorite, but he was uh, definitely just an influence on the name. <laughs> All right, last one, and this is a controversial one on campus. So, Red Sox or Yankees? Mets. Mets. Okay. Neither one. We're going with the Mets. How are the Mets, Mets. going to do this year? They're spending a lot of money. 
Yeah, hopefully they'll be good. I'm, I definitely won't lie. I'm more of a, a Knicks and Jets fan than I am a Mets fan. I've kind of given up on the on the Mets after so much heartbreak. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> God, when is the last time any any of those teams won a championship? Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. I'd like to thank my guest, Chris Mee, for joining us today on Connect with Chris. And please be sure to turn into our podcast, Uncommon Grounds, where I speak to School of Communication students about their Quinnipiac University experience. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. All right. See you soon. Have a good one. Bye.